This last lecture in the momentum series is going to be about using momentum to predict what will happen in different types of collisions. There are three types of collisions when two objects interact. The first type is an elastic collision. This is what happens when two objects collide and do not attach to each other. They just bounce off of each other like this. One way I like to remember that is thinking about elastic things as being bouncy, like elastic bands and things like that. So in a similar way, an elastic collision is when two objects bounce off of each other. An inelastic collision is the opposite of an elastic collision. This is when two objects collide and attach to each other. So after the collision, they behave as one single object. And an explosion is when one object splits off into two objects like this. The big idea used in collision problems is that the total momentum in the whole system of the two objects is the same before and after the collision. We're going to be talking a lot about conservation in terms of collisions, not only in this unit, but also in the energy unit. And there's more to say about these types of collisions with energy, but for now, this video is only going to focus on momentum. So we use the conservation of momentum to predict the results of all three types of collisions. I'm going to start with two examples from elastic collisions. I'm going to say that right is positive and left is negative here. And the first problem says a five kilogram ball rolls to the right at 10 meters per second and collides with a three kilogram ball moving to the left at six meters per second. After the collision, the five kilogram ball rolls to the left at two meters per second. What is the velocity of the three kilogram ball after the collision? The first step to solving any collision problem is finding the total momentum in the system because that's going to remain the same before and after the collision. So the idea of the total momentum staying the same is how we use information about what's happening before the collision to help us predict what's happening after. So we can see that before the collision, I have a momentum of five times 10 plus a momentum of three times negative six. And that's going to be equal to the total momentum after the collision. And after the collision, the blue five kilogram ball is now moving to the left. So its velocity of two meters per second is negative. So its momentum is five times negative two. And the momentum of the three kilogram ball is gonna be three times the velocity that we're trying to solve for. So if you get a setup like this where you're able to set the momentum before the collision equal to the momentum after the collision and plug in all your variables, you usually only have one variable left to solve for. And if you only have one variable, you can always solve for that using algebra. Solving for V here using algebra, I find that V is equal to 14 meters per second to the right. So that means that after this collision, the three kilogram ball is going to move away to the right at 14 meters per second. Example number two says that a truck moving forward at 10 meters per second hits a thousand kilogram car moving forward at five meters per second. After the collision, the car moves forward at 11 meters per second and the truck moves forward at six meters per second. What is the mass of the truck? So we can also use conservation to figure out information about the mass of an object. This example is an example of a collision that happens when both objects are moving in the same direction. So this can also happen. Objects can definitely still hit each other even if they're moving in the same direction, as long as the object behind the other one is moving faster than the object in front. So this is what the collision looks like. And we're trying to figure out the mass of that truck using the information that we have. And again, we know that the total momentum is remaining the same before and after the collision. So before the collision, the momentum is the momentum of the truck, which is m, its mass, which we're trying to solve for, times 10, plus the momentum of the car, which is 1,000 kilograms times 5 meters per second. And both velocities are positive here because they're both moving in the same positive direction. After the collision, the truck is moving at 6 meters per second, so that's what I multiply its mass by, and the car is now moving at 11 meters per second. And I know that these two equations are equal to each other because the total sum of the momentums before the collision is equal to the total after. Solving for mass using the setup gets me a final mass of 1,500 kilograms. So that's the mass of the truck. So that's pretty interesting. If we know the final velocities and initial velocities of two objects that are in a collision, we can predict the mass of one of the objects. There's a special rule for elastic collisions about hitting a wall. If an object hits a wall with an elastic collision, it bounces off with a velocity of the same magnitude and opposite direction that had originally pointed directly into the wall. As an example, if this four kilogram object moving at five meters per second hits the wall like this, it's reflected back with a new velocity of five meters per second in the opposite direction like this. 
So I actually can't explain why this is happening right now. I'm going to explain why this happens in the energy unit. Notice that the total momentum of the ball does change here because this is now an open system. The wall is connected to the earth. That's one reason why the momentum is changing. The other reason why the momentum is changing is because the velocity now points in the opposite direction. So if we call right positive, this ball started with a momentum of positive 20 newton seconds and ended with a velocity of negative 20 newton seconds. So the total change in momentum was actually negative 40 because you were going from positive 20 to negative 20. If an object hits a wall at an angle, the only part of the velocity that's flipped is the component perpendicular to the wall. So if you have an object moving toward the wall like this, the component of its velocity that's perpendicular to the wall is the blue arrow, the vertical arrow. So I'm going to flip that to the opposite side and say magnitude. The red arrow, the horizontal velocity, is parallel to the wall. So anything that's parallel to the wall is not flipped. So that's staying the same direction and the same size. I can see that the total velocity is now going to look like this, and the ball is going to move away from the wall like that. This kind of fits our experience of how objects hit walls. Notice that this means that the angle an object impacts a wall will always be equal to the angle it leaves the wall, because the two triangles are the same, they have the same magnitude, just with a different arrangement of where one of the components is. Okay, that was information about elastic collisions. We're now going to move to inelastic collisions. We're going to start with example number one, a 70 kilogram football player moving right at 10 meters per second collides with a 60 kilogram player moving eight meters to the left. After they collide, they move together across the field. What is their velocity? So the collision looks like this. So they're behaving as if they're one object. They're not actually, but because they are moving together, we can model them as if they are one single object. So I can see that the total momentum before the collision is going to be the 70 kilogram football player's momentum, which is 70 times 10, plus the 60 kilogram player's momentum, which is 60 kilograms times negative eight meters per second. And I know that that is equal to the final momentum, but now the final momentum is going to look a little bit different because they're behaving as one big object. So if they're one big object, the mass of that one big object is actually just going to be the two masses of the objects before the collision added together. If a 70 kilogram player and a 60 kilogram player collide, they behave like a single 130 kilogram object. So using my equation for momentum, after the collision, I only have one object with one single momentum with a mass of 70 plus 60 and a velocity v that I'm trying to find. So I write that as m times v, which here is 70 plus 60 all multiplied by v. Using algebra to solve for v, I get that the velocity by itself is equal to positive 1.7 meters per second. So that doesn't only tell me the magnitude, it also tells me the direction that the two football players are moving after the collision. They're moving in the same direction that I defined to be positive, which was the original direction of the 70 kilogram player, which fits our intuition if a larger object with a larger velocity hits a smaller object with a smaller velocity, we would expect that if they stick together, that single object will be moving in the same direction as the larger object rather than the smaller object. Let's do an example where both objects are moving in the same direction. A cart moves forward at six meters per second and connects with a two kilogram cart moving forward at four meters per second. After they connect, they move forward together at 5.33 meters per second. What is the mass of the first cart? So this is what that collision looks like. And this is the equation. Before the collision, the two momentums look like this. And after the collision, there's just a single momentum, the total mass times the total velocity. And I'm considering the mass of the first cart to just be a variable here that I'm trying to solve for. Solving for mass here gets me a final answer of four kilograms. If you plug that into the original equation, that comes out to be correct. So for inelastic collisions, you're always going to want to consider the two objects after the collision as one single object with a mass equal to the sum of the two smaller masses that made it up. I can now give you two examples of explosions. Let's say that we have a 50 kilogram astronaut floating in space and she wants to get back to her space station. She has a five kilogram hammer that she throws at 20 meters per second in the opposite direction. How fast does she drift toward the space station as a result? So this is what that looks like. 
So I can see that the total momentum before anything happens is actually equal to zero because both the astronaut and the hammer are not moving relative to the space station because both the astronaut and the hammer are not moving relative to the space station before this collision happens. And after the explosion happens, when the one big object of the astronaut plus hammer splits into two smaller objects, this is what the total momentum looks like. We have the mass of the astronaut, 50 kilograms, times her velocity, which is what we're trying to solve for, plus the mass of the hammer, 5 kilograms, times its velocity, which is negative 20. It's very important that that's negative if we're considering the other velocity to be positive, because the hammer is moving in the opposite direction of the astronaut. Plugging this in, I can see that 100 newton seconds is equal to 50 kilograms times the velocity of the astronaut. So that means that if the astronaut throws that hammer away at 20 meters per second, she's going to drift at 2 meters per second back to the space station. You may have seen science fiction movies that use this trick, this idea that if an astronaut wants to get somewhere different and they're stuck, they can throw an object in the opposite direction of where they want to go and they'll drift in the direction that they want to go. The reason why that happens is based on the conservation of momentum. If you have zero momentum to start off and then you throw something that's attached to you in one direction, you're going to move in the other direction to keep the total momentum equal to zero. Here's example number two. A skateboarder at rest holds a five kilogram brick and throws it to the left at five meters per second. And if the skateboarder rolls away at 0.5 meters per second, what is their mass? I can see that again, this is a situation where the starting momentum is zero and the final momentum is equal to the brick's mass times velocity plus the skater's mass times the velocity. Solving for m gets me a mass of 50 kilograms, so that's the mass of the skater. We can talk about more complex situations where we have two-dimensional collisions. This is when collisions occur at an angle, and when this happens, we can use the fact that the total momentum on each axis stays the same to find missing information. Here's an example for an elastic collision. We have a five kilogram object moving to the right at 10 meters per second, and it collides with a three kilogram object and moves down at eight meters per second at a 30 degree angle after the collision. So we can use this information to try to find the final velocity of the other ball, the three kilogram ball, after the collision. So let's start by finding the momentum in each direction, in each axis, before the collision and after the collision. So in the x direction before the collision, I can see that the five kilogram ball has this momentum, five times 10, and the three kilogram ball doesn't have any momentum because it's not moving. And in the x direction after the collision, the five kilogram ball has this new x velocity using a trig to find that x component of the velocity. So its new momentum is going to be its mass times that new velocity. And the new x direction momentum of the three kilogram ball after the collision is going to be its mass, three kilograms, times its new x velocity, the velocity that it has only in the x direction. So I'm going to move this down here. And I can see that if the total momentum just in the x direction is conserved, then this equation is true and I'm only missing one variable. So I can solve for that one variable, vx. And when I plug that into my calculator, I find that vx is equal to 5.12 meters per second in the x direction. So we know that that is 100% the case as long as this is an elastic collision. Now let's look at the y direction. I can see that in the y direction before the collision, there's nothing happening. Nothing is moving up or down at all. And so the y direction momentum to start off is just going to be zero Newton seconds. After the collision, both objects are moving in the y direction. So I can see that the five kilogram object is moving at four meters per second in the y direction using trig eight times sine of 30. And I'm going to consider down to be negative here. So if I do that, I'm going to say that the momentum of the five kilogram ball is five times negative four meters per second. Looking at the y momentum of the three kilogram ball, I know that this has some velocity in the y direction. So its momentum in the y direction is going to be three kilograms times its velocity in the y direction. So I'm going to bring that down here. And again, I only have one missing variable, so I can use that to solve the problem. So solving that, I can see that the velocity in the y direction is 6.67 meters per second. And I can now use this information to find the total velocity using the Pythagorean theorem. When I do that, I find that the total velocity of the three kilogram ball is 8.41 meters per second. And this is at an angle of 52 degrees. I can find that using an inverse trig function because they have all three sides. I can use any inverse trig function that I want to find that but the angle is 52 degrees on this ball. 
So that's an example of using conservation of momentum to predict the final movement of objects that hit each other at an angle. We can also do an inelastic example. These I actually think are normally easier than elastic collisions in two dimensions. We can imagine that this five kilogram ball is moving to the right at two meters per second and the three kilogram ball is moving down at two meters per second and they collide, stick together, and move off with some new velocity, and we want to know what that velocity is. So again, setting up this equation in the x direction, I can see that the five kilogram ball has an x direction velocity of two meters per second, so its momentum is five times two, and there's nothing happening in the x direction for the three kilogram ball. It's just moving up and down, so it has no newton seconds of momentum. So that means that this is going to be equal to the total momentum of the single object after in the x direction. So that object has a total mass of 5 plus 3 kilograms and a total velocity in the x direction of vx. So I'll save that to solve in just a minute while I solve for the y direction momentum first. In the y direction, I can see that the 5 kilogram ball doesn't have any motion in the y direction before the collision but the three kilogram ball does. The three kilogram ball is moving down at two meters per second, so its momentum is going to be three times two. After the collision, again, this is a single object with a mass of five plus three, and it now has a y direction velocity vy. So this is the momentum that is happening in the y direction after the collision. So I can use algebra to find that the x velocity of this object is 1.25, and the y velocity is 0.75, and using the Pythagorean theorem, the total velocity is 1.46 meters per second. And using inverse trig functions, the angle is 31 degrees. So that's it. Those are a bunch of examples of solving problems with different types of collisions, elastic, inelastic, and explosions. All of these examples were just using the same fact that momentum is conserved along an axis as long as there are no outside forces on the objects. And the only difference is whether the objects behave as a single object or as multiple objects before and after a collision.